Hi, welcome to Introductory Macroeconomics, and in this video, I'll be going through some of the key basic elements that you will need to master to be great at this topic. The first thing we need to ask ourselves is, what is macroeconomics, and why is this different from micro? In a nutshell, macroeconomics is looking at the bigger picture of the economy. An economy actually makes up of many different types of entities, and we're going to be seeing this in detail later. An economy is also known as a country, so for example, Singapore, Hong Kong, China, um, the United States of America, etc. etc. So let's take a look at what are the different types of entities that make up the economy. So the first one is actually your consumers or what we call households. These are pretty much ordinary citizens of the economy, people like you and me. And it's also made up of firms or industries who run pretty much businesses and other similar activities. It is also made up of the government bodies and there's also the foreign sector into play. So, you know, as we live in a more globalized world, there's always relationships between different countries and these things require economic analysis as well. So how this is different from microeconomics is... Money takes a whole new level of importance when it comes to our analysis. And uh, just to share with you, money is also known as liquidity. So, with money in the picture, what will occur is borrowing and lending activities. So, people borrow and lend for many different reasons. Um, let's not dwell into that. And when there's borrowing and lending, what you actually have is this thing called interest rates. Right? So if you're going to borrow money, you're going to have to pay interest. And if you lend money, you're going to be earning interest income. So interest rates actually affect the level of spending um, in this particular economy. And spending actually translates to income. Uh, we're going to go through this uh, a bit later. So let's look at why interest rates is going to affect spending. So if interest rates are relatively low, what this means is that the opportunity cost of holding money in your own pocket instead of putting it in a bank is low because the amount of interest rates you could have earned from the bank is low, right? So spending is going to increase because you have got money in your pockets, you're going to spend. If interest rates are higher, then the opportunity cost of holding money in your own pocket is going to increase because you could have earned that higher interest rates from the bank. So you're going to put your money in the bank, therefore, with lesser money in your pocket, you're going to spend less. Therefore, when interest rates are low, you actually save lesser, you spend more. And when interest rates are high, you save more and you spend less. Here you can see the inverse relationship. Now, income actually measures the performance of an economy. And the performance of an economy is actually managed by the government bodies. So the government bodies using certain policies can affect the interest rates of the economy, therefore affecting the performance or the income of the economy. And more specifically, we're talking about monetary um, policies. So how do we measure economic activity? Um, what are the indicators that we should be looking out for to determine whether the performance of the government is up to par? So what we usually measure is this thing called GDP, uh, which stands for the Gross Domestic Product. Um, it is also known as income output, and the short form for it is actually a capital Y. So the GDP is actually the value of the total output of the economy in a particular year. So why do we want to measure the value of the total output in the economy? Well, that's because output equals to income. And if we know the income levels, then we know whether the government is running the economy properly or not. We're going to be going through in detail why output is equals to income later, but in a nutshell, uh, we are assuming that what we produce, we are going to sell it locally as well as to foreign countries as well. So this actually translates into income for us. So another way of measuring um, output is actually the GNP, which stands for the Gross uh, National Product. And this is defined as the value of output by citizens of that particular country. So this is a um, more strict way of measuring output. Um, because this accounts for local businesses as well as citizens um, who are located overseas. So in a nutshell, to calculate your GNP, what you do is you're going to take your value of the GDP and you're going to add your net income. So what is net income? To calculate net income, what you're going to do is take total income minus total payments. Income here refers to the income that is earned by citizens or businesses that are located in this country or overseas. 
payment refers to, of course, like payments to foreigners who are located within that country itself. So I'm going to use a real life example to illustrate what I mean. Take Singapore for the example. Uh, this is a country where there is a lot of foreign talents coming into the country to work and what happens is that their salaries is known as payments to foreigners. At the same time, there are also a lot of Singaporeans that are going overseas to find jobs. The incomes that they earn are known as the income to citizens that are of Singapore, right? So they are overseas but it still counts towards income uh, for a Singaporean. So therefore, this is included into the value of the GNP. So our focus is still going to be on GDP and we're going to now learn three approaches to calculate this value of the GDP. Two of them are not going to be used for this syllabus, so we're just going through that for your um, general knowledge. So the first approach is known as the product approach. And what you're doing here is to add up the values of all the final goods and services produced by this economy. And the key word here is the word final. So I think this is best explained with an example. So I'm going to assume that there are two companies in this economy. And of course, you're going to have some workers, right? So you're going to have a company that sells plastics. And you're going to have another company that sells maybe um, drinks. So the plastic company is going to sell plastics to the drink company um, so that the drink company can create bottles and put their drinks in it and they have a final product. So maybe it's a, it's a bottle of um, water or something. So the plastic company has got a revenue of say maybe $100 by selling these plastics to the drinks company and it's gonna pay its workers an amount of $80 so you have a profit of 20 bucks. So the drink company is gonna have a revenue of maybe say $300, it's gonna pay rent of 50 bucks, it's gonna pay wages of maybe um, 60 bucks, and they paid for the plastic material, right? And this we know is 100 bucks. So if you're gonna find the total profit of the drinks company, we're just gonna take 300 minus 50 minus 60 minus 100, and you have a profit of $90. So the product approach says to sum up the value of all the final goods and services. So we can see from here that the final goods and services is actually $300, right? Um, assuming each bottle is sold at three bucks. So therefore the final value um, of 100 final goods will be $300 and that is 100 goods multiplied by 3 bucks. So that is your GDP using the product approach. The second approach is known as the income approach and this is very simple. Um, you are adding up all the income that is earned by the country's resources. And I think we went through what are resources back in chapter 1. So just to recap, um, your total income would come from labor, land, capital as well as entrepreneurship. So these are the four different kinds of resources an economy can have. And we know that labor is going to be earning wages, land will earn you rent, capital will give you interest, and entrepreneurs earn profits. So let's go back to the previous example and see how we can use the income approach to calculate GDP. So let's identify the different types of income here. So you've got wages, all right? um, you've got rent, and you've got profits, right? So we're going to add up all these things here. Uh, but before that, you know, profit can actually include um, capital since, you know, entrepreneurs invest money into their, their businesses uh, to buy machinery. Therefore, you know, we can just assume that profit uh, includes interest income. So I'm going to add up the, uh, all, all these figures over here. And what you will see is that I'm going to get the same figure of 300. So the income approach and the product approach actually give you the same GDP. So now let's move on to the last approach, which is, which is your more important one, and you have to know this. It is known as the expenditure approach. The expenditure approach is the one that you'll be using for your entire course of macroeconomics. So you have to know this very well. What you're going to do is to simply add up all the expenditure from the different entities in the economy. Okay, so the first, the first entity are the households and what they do is that they consume. So consumption is one of the expenditure and this is denoted by capital C. You've got investment by the firms and this is denoted by capital I. You've got spending by the government, so this is denoted by capital G. And you're going to have the foreign sector as well. And the activities in the foreign sector include your exports and your imports. So what you want to do is to take your exports less your imports so that you get your 
net exports. So what you are going to do next is to add up the total value of all these expenditure. And when you add something up, what you do, what you're actually doing is to aggregate all these things. So this is actually the aggregate expenditure. So to calculate the aggregate expenditure or AE, you just simply add all of them up. And I can summarize this as C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Uh, we're going to talk about the foreign sector in the later videos. So I think the next question you have to ask yourself is, why does adding up expenditure give me my income? Why is aggregate expenditure equals to income? So before we go there, I just want to share with you the concept of real versus nominal GDP. And we want to actually focus on real GDP instead of nominal. Um, so as you can see, $300 is actually nominal GDP. 10 bottles of water is going to be my real GDP. So we are always concerned with the amount of goods that we can buy instead of the amount of money we have. Well, I mean, what difference does it make if you've got $1 million but you can only buy one cup of tea? No point, right? So I'm going to use some examples to show you why expenditure is equals to income. So we've got one guy over here with the um, silver mustache and he produces computers. And you've got another guy here um, and I think he's going to be wearing a black hat. Okay, so he's wearing a black hat. And this guy has got $20 with him. So if let's say the black hat guy buys a computer from him for $20, um, what you'll see here is that the income made by the, by the silver mustache guy is going to be $20. So that's nominal GDP, right? Now the real GDP is going to be simply one computer. So as you can see, the expenditure and the income is actually the same. Whatever the black hat guy spends is income to the silver moustache guy. So now I'm going to add more people to the economy and I'm going to show you how the um, concept of A equals to Y is still going to work. So we've got people producing um, wallets, people producing computers, um, fan fancy pens, watches, and there's this guy that's producing awesome cars. So if the wallet guy is going to sell his wallet to the car guy for an amount of maybe say $30, um, the income to him is going to be 30 bucks, and the car guy is going to have to spend 30 bucks. So as you can see, expenditure equals to income. So we're just going to go along the circle. The computer guy is going to sell the computer to the moustache guy for 40 bucks, and the, the moustache guy is going to spend 40 bucks. So that's income and expenditure. So we're going to go around the entire circle again. So you've got your pen guy selling uh, the, the, the crown guy, the pen, for 10 bucks, And you've got a watch guy selling the watch to the uh, bow tie guy for maybe 20 bucks. So, and the, 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 the hat guy actually buys that awesome car from the other guy for an amount of $100. So expenditure is also 100 bucks. What you're going to do is you're going to add up all of these figures here. And what you're going to get is your GDP. Uh, in terms of nominal values, right? Because all these are in cash. The the real GDP is actually um, the goods and services. So there are five goods over here. And um, so that's how you're using the expenditure approach to calculate income. And I've just shown you why expenditure is equals to income. Therefore, at equilibrium, which means that the market clears of excess demand and excess supply, aggregate expenditure equals to income, which is equals to consumption, plus investment, plus government spending, plus exports, less your imports. And just a brief introduction, imports actually reduces your level of income because this is actually value that's flowing out of the economy. Think about it, when you buy something overseas, what they're doing is that you're giving money to an external person and this money is not going to come back to the economy, your economy. So that is why uh, imports is not part of your income. While there is a lot of emphasis placed on GDP or income, there are also other key variables that you should take note of. So what are they? Now, the first thing, of course, is your GDP or your income. And you also have to take note of your interest rates. Uh, we just talked about this previously, uh, with money playing a more important role in macroeconomics. And just like income, interest comes in nominal as well as real forms. So for nominal interest, we're going to denote it with a small letter I or capital letter R. And of course, you're going to have real interest. And real interest is actually your nominal interest minus your expected inflation. The expected inflation rate refers to the inflation rate which consumers, households and firms expect for the next year. 
You are not expected to know this for introductory economics, but I think it will be pretty helpful for you. So the next variable we'll be talking about is price, and we denote price with a capital letter P. Next, we're going to talk about inflation. So, so what is inflation? Inflation is basically the rate at which price is changing. So it can be going up or going down. So in summary, your inflation is the rate of price change. So going back to touch briefly on the expected inflation rate, this refers to but how much do people think that the price level is going to change by next year. And the inflation rate is usually expressed in a percentage form, and this is the percentage change on a year-to-year -year basis. So the next thing we're going to talk about is your wage levels. So wages come in nominal, which is denoted by a capital W, and also in a real form. So if you're going to take the nominal wage divided by the price level, you're going to get the real wage, which is denoted by a small letter W. And as we might have studied in macroeconomics, the real wage determines the level of labor supply. And the last variable I'm going to be talking about is the level of unemployment, which is denoted by a capital U. And you will observe a inverse relationship between output and unemployment. Well, this makes sense, right? If there is high output, then there's lower unemployment. And if output is lower, then unemployment will increase. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about time. I'm sure from my experience in microeconomics, you're going to be seeing short run and long run analysis of um, economics. So the short run refers to certain variables being fixed, and these variables are your price level and your wages. Therefore, in the long run, when prices and wages become flexible, you actually have very different economic analysis. So let's take a look at this um, you know, one by one. So when your prices and wages are fixed, what you face is this thing called nominal rigidities. And the reason why prices and wages might remain fixed in the short run is because of uh, employment contracts um, and it may be because of trade agreements as well. So prices and wages might be cast in stone um, or better known as contracts for a certain amount of time. And how rigid prices and wages can be actually affects the economy in a certain way. Therefore, we're going to have very different economic analysis. So I'm just going to talk about the last thing before we end off this video. We're going to talk about the main type of graphs that you must learn to be good at macroeconomics. So these are the essential tools for you to understand the questions in exams and you have to use them to answer the questions as well. I'm going to break this down into two possible scenarios. The first scenario will be fixed prices and wages. The second one will be flexible prices and wages. So in fixed prices and wages, you can have either a closed economy or an open economy. A closed economy is one that does not trade with other economies. An open economy is one that trades, therefore you have to take into account net exports into your analysis. For a simple closed economy with fixed prices and wages, you're going to need to use the ISLM model, which stands for the Investment Savings Liquidity Preference Market Equilibrium. So you're going to have interest rates on the vertical axis and output on the horizontal axis. There you have your IS curves and your LM curves, and this will give you your equilibrium levels of interest and output. For an open economy, you're going to have to use the ISLM model and you're going to add on the balance of payment or the net exports line. So choosing between using the BP line or the annex line depends on how mobile capital is. We'll be going through this in detail when it comes to the last chapter of Introduction to Economics. We will even be talking about exchange rate policies being fixed or flexible. So moving on to the scenario of flexible prices and wages, we will only be talking about a closed economy. Um, talking about an open economy will make you vomit blood and die. Um, you know, you'll actually be covering this in a level 300 module called monetary economics. So in a closed economy with flexible prices and wages, you'll be using the ISLM model and the ADAS model, which stands for aggregate demand and aggregate supply equilibrium. So the reason why we want to have this ADAS curve is because we want to account for the analysis of price changes and how this will affect the economy. Therefore, the vertical axis on the ADAS curve is actually the price level. A lot of feedback from students say that um, the ADAS model is one of the more difficult um, concepts to understand. But uh, through a track history, um, we all know that studying with quick economics will actually help you to understand that in a very simple manner and it's going to be specific to what your syllabus requires you to know. With that, I want to thank you for studying with Quick Economics. I'm going to see you in the rest of the macroeconomics videos.